back to Jason J. Campbell, and this is the third installment on my lectures on symbolic logic. We began this lecture, um, the, the previous lectures, discussing five basic rules of inference. And we discussed those five basic rules of inference, and I gave examples to try and help simplify and clarify how these rules of inference apply to uh, the formation and analysis of argument. In the second video, what we did, what I did, was I went to discuss and sort of hopefully clarify how truth tables are constructed, what truth tables are, what truth function, what um, a statement that has truth functionality is, what it means to have a statement that has truth functionality. The example that I gave was today is Saturday. If the statement today is Saturday is true, because it is in fact Saturday, then we can say that the truth functionality of that statement is true, and we represent that with a T. If the truth functionality of the statement today is Saturday is false, then we, rep we represent the truth functionality of that falsity with the letter F. And then what I did was uh, I showed you how to construct a, a truth table. We go conjunct first, disjunct second, conditional third, biconditional fourth, and we filled in the truth table. Um, and that ended the last lecture. In this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to use the idea now of truth functionality to discuss and to describe um, uh, a very sort of interesting uh, topic on the notion of the characteristics that God has. And this isn't referred to the Judeo-Christian or the um, Islamic conception of God. This is just any conception of, of God that there is. If, and you can see now, right, remember we've, we've been, we've been, hopefully, hopefully I've been successful in letting you understand how arguments are structured. So when someone says, if this happens, then this happens, you understand that what's being stated is a conditional statement. So what I'm saying right now is a conditional statement. If an individual believes in the existence of God, then their belief in the existence of God um, conforms to the powers that God is said to have. And irrespective of what religious beliefs you have or what religious denomination you might be a, a, a member of, what's interesting, rather than looking at all the differences that people have in their religion, our religion believes this, your religion doesn't believe what we believe, and so on and so on, um, the actual fact of it all, on a logical level, is that the characteristics that God is said to have in a very general sense is shared across almost all religions. Um, uh, especially um, with respect to the, 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 the big three monotheistic religions. This might not be so true for uh, polytheistic religions, but with respect to the, the, the big three monotheistic religions, this is certainly true. Okay, so what are we going to do in this lecture? What am I going to do in this lecture? I'm going to discuss the characteristics of God. The characteristics of God and its use in a characteristics that God has and its use in a truth table. So what we're going to do first is we're going to define, and again, um, this is a very, very, this is a millennia old argument, uh, and I'm not going to get into the history of how the argument was constructed and how it was uh, developed and so on, um, but I'm going to, and, and also the characteristics that I'm going to list uh, in no sense are exhaustive, right? There, there are definitely more attributes that God is said to have but the three main attributes that God are said to have are the characteristics. Well, and I'll write three, three characteristics of God. The first characteristic that God is said to have is that God is said to be omnipotent. Omnipotent. 
And if someone says that God is omnipotent, what they're claiming is that God is all-powerful. So, what does omnipotence mean? Omnipotence means that God is all-powerful. He, she, however God is conceptualized, God has the power to create, destroy anything, bring things into exist existence out of nothing, and so on. The second characteristic that God is said to have in this argument is one of omniscience. O-M-N-I-S-C-I-E-N. -I -E omniscience. And to be omniscient is to be all-knowing. God knows everything. He knows, she knows everything um, that happens within the universe simultaneously and at all times throughout infinity, right? There is no limitation on the knowledge that, that God has. So the first characteristic is omnipotent, and there is no order to how this is being presented. This is just my preference. I can put this first, put this second, it doesn't really matter. First characteristic is omnipotence. Second characteristic is omniscience. And the last characteristic, and also remember, I'm not saying that these are um, uh, exhaustive. Uh, for example, I'm not going to list omnipresent, meaning everywhere at all times. However, that is generally agreed that that is a characteristic of God. Um, what I am going to list is these three. There are plenty more characteristics that God is said to have. However, with respect to the argument and maintaining the structure of the argument and thereby maintaining the structure of the truth table, which I'll construct later, uh, it's important to uh, limit our characteristics to three. Otherwise, it gets extremely complicated. So, we say that God is omnipotent, he is all-powerful, God is omniscient, he is all-knowing, and then lastly, God is omni. Some people hyphenate it, some people don't, I won't hyphenate it. God is omnibenevolent. Benevolence to be loving, God is all-loving. God loves the worst of us, right? God loves the worst of us. There's always the possibility for redemption. Um, so these are the characteristics that God has. God is omnipotent. He's all-knowing. God is omniscient. He or she is all... Uh, God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. And he's omnibenevolent. He's all-loving. Okay. So that sort of just... That's just definition. That doesn't really create too much of a, a problem. What ends up happening, however is that in discussing the characteristics of God, we also realize that evil exists within the world. Um, as you might know, I'm, um, I was trained as a philosopher, and I am a genocide scholar. I'm interested in you know, mass violence, state-endorsed violence, um, the Holocaust, mass execution, and you think to yourself, man, the world that we live in is a pretty horrible place. Yeah, of course, a lot of good happens. There's a lot of altruism. There's a lot of um, beneficence. But there's also a, a, a very dark side to, um, to our existence. And I'm not going to go into all the graphic details. We all know how evil the world can be. That's pretty obvious. The question is, however, if we say that God has these characteristics... Right? This is how the argument is, has been constructed you know, over the last 2,000 years. If we say that God has these characteristics and conjunction, and we also say that evil exists, then there's, there's a problem, right? It doesn't make sense. That's where it be becomes confusing, right? How could God, who is defined by having these characteristics, allow something like evil to exist within the world. And this is where the tension arises. Now, um, some people might use this argument to then say, you know, God, therefore God doesn't exist, or, you know, the existence of God is absurd because evil exists. I'm not doing that. I'm not here to convert or not convert. I'm not here to have a religious discussion, to be honest with you. What I'm here to do is to analyze the thought of God's characteristics and try to... Um, understand how these characteristics fit with 
the acceptance of evil. 